till I come give attendance to reading, exhortation, to doctrine. And what I want to preach to you about this morning is the threefold cord of Bible study. The threefold cord of Bible study. You see, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12, that a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Meaning this, that a cord that is made of three separate strands that are woven together is something that is not quickly broken. Whereas one on its own might break rather easily, the Bible say, the Bible's teaching us here that something that consists of three cords would be much stronger. That's very true. We would see that even if you look at modern cabling today. Cables that hold up large bridges are not just one single strand of, of steel, but they're rather many strands of steel that are woven together and twisted together. And even those are then twisted to other ones. And you have many bands of steel that are, are, are create a very strong cord. And I believe that the Bible is showing us here that <coughs> that there is actually that that a a threefold cord is being prescribed here in First Timothy, First Timothy chapter four and verse thirteen. We see that where it says, I "Give it until I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine." So we see that there are three things here: reading, exhortation, and doctrine. And these three things make up the threefold cord of Bible study. Now you'd say, well, what's the point? Why should we even consider ourselves this? What? But we have to understand today that there's a very, uh, there's, there's a very real need that we have a strong cord of Bible study, that we have a very uh, a strong and stable cord that is able to, to hold us. Because the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, evil men and seducers shall work worse Wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So the Bible is telling us there in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that when, as the end times approach, things are going to get worse and worse. It's the complete opposite of what so many people want to think, that things are going to get better and better. No, the Bible says that the things are going to get worse and worse in terms of evil men and seducers. It's not in terms of you know our lives are going to become more and more miserable. It's just that there's going to be more seducers and evil men out there seeking to deceive us and that it's going to be worse and worse. And as time presses on that we grow closer to the coming of Christ, we're going to see more and more evil and wicked men trying to seduce us. And that is why we need to have a strong threefold cord of Bible study. Now, even the strongest anchors in the world require a chain. They require a chain. Sometimes I'll, I'll watch these, uh, these, these videos about, uh, there's some that I saw of, of these great big ships when they drop these anchors. They drop these massive, huge anchors that are capable of going down and holding just these gigantic ships in place. And all these anchors, as big as they are, they would be completely useless if it were not for a very large chain consisting of very, very large links. Many of what, one of the links alone would probably weigh many several hundreds of pounds. So even the strongest of anchors is of no use without a strong chain. And that's why we need to have a strong cord. Yes, we have the Word of God. We have an anchor that we can, our souls can attach to that, can, that hold us firm in the midst of the waves of life and, and the waves of false doctrine. We have a very strong anchor, but it does us no good if we have not connected a very strong cord between us and the Word of God, between our minds and our hearts and the Word of God. We must develop a strong cord. The way that it is done here is through reading, exhortation, and doctrine. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. You see, even a, a, a brittle cord will break under increasing pressure. And that's what we see, at, as it says there, that men shall wax worse and worse. Meaning as time goes on, there's going to be more stress and more strain put upon the, the cord of, of, of doctrine that is holding us to the Word of God. The men are going to try and push us harder and harder away from the things of God. They're going to try and push us away harder and harder away from the foundation of our faith, the Bible, the Word of God. There are many ancient heresies that are still alive and well today, if you think about it. I mean, the oldest of all would be work salvation. You think of, of Cain bringing the, the, the fruit of the ground to offer to God when he was instructed to bring the blood of the Lamb, trying to work his own way to heaven. That's a heresy that has gone nowhere. But it's been here from the, from the beginning of time. It's been a consistent pressure against the Word of God and against the Spirit of God that, that there are those that would desire to, to teach and instruct others that they have to in some way work their way to heaven. 
And it shows up in many different forms, but it's all basically the same thing. Some people will tell you, you know, that there's certain sacraments that you have to fulfill within the Catholic Church in order to go to heaven. That you have to be baptized and catechized and homogenized and pasteurized and all these other things that you have to do. They also tell you, you know, that there's a... Uh, some people will try to say, you know, you can lose your salvation. That if you don't behave right, that somehow God is going to punish you by, by putting you, uh, you know, sending you to hell and not allowing you to come to heaven. Which makes no sense. I mean, if salvation is a free gift, and when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we become His child, we know that we will always be His children, and that we will be able to go one day to dwell with Him at home in heaven. Now, it's not to say that God won't punish us on this earth, you know, in our physical life, but spiritually we know that if we are born again by the Word of God, that we will go to heaven when we die, no matter what. We cannot lose that. So there's this ancient heresy of work salvation. This is just one example that shows up in many different forms. You know, people that will say, you know, you have to repent of your sin to be saved. People that will say that you have to give up a certain sin or multitude of sins in order to prove that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's just not the case. We know that's not the case. And that's not the thrust of the message here. That's not the point I'm trying to make. But what I'm trying to show us here is that there has always been this constant pressure upon the people of God against the Word of God to push people off the rock of their faith, the Word of God. And if it were not for a strong cord of, of understanding, of Bible study, of the knowledge of the Word of God, we would not be where we are today. We would not have men that have, have, have withstood those, those waves of heresy that have come crashing against them. And we see even today, as it says, you know, men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. It's going to get worse. So even though we still deal with these ancient heresies that have, are, are still prevalent today, there's also new ones that are arising. It's getting worse and worse. You know, we, we think about these the, the Hebrew roots. Now, I don't know how new that really is. I mean, you could just call it Judaizing, which is something that's been going on for thousands of years now. But the Hebrew roots and the sacred name movement and, and, and this, uh, this, this desire to bring people back under the law. And, you know, other just foolish and, and, and silly doctrines that are popping up like the flat earth. Things that I believe are designed to make Christians look stupid. That would, that would give... Uh, a, a bad name, the, the name of Christ. Uh, uh, something as foolish as the flat earth where a person could um, you know, point to it and say, well look, Christians believe that in, a, in a flat earth when it can be proven that it isn't, very simply. So we should avoid these things. And we have to understand that these things are going to pop up. You know, we think even uh, recently of the, the whole oneness thing that, it, that, it, that, 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 that came through, the anti-Trinitarian view, which is just a, a fundamental doctrine, the Trinity of the faith. But even that is something that we have to stand against. And what I'm trying to say is that, is that even though we're, they're, they're, that there are ancient heresies, we have to understand that they're not going to go away, but rather that even more heresy is going to be added and added and added. And as we grow closer to the time of the coming of Christ and the rise of the Antichrist, we must understand that things are going to wax worse and worse in terms of false doctrine, in terms of heresy, in terms of those that would seek to deceive us and draw us away from the Word of God. Now, Paul tells us here specifically that the three cords that we need to bring together to found ourselves to the Word of God, to attach ourselves to the anchor of the Word of God, are reading, exhortation, and doctrine. And that these three disciplines will create a strong cord that will, that will secure us to the Word of God. We'll be like that rock climber on the face of the rock who's trying to get to the top. I mean, that is the Christian life. We are trying to reach through great struggle and through difficulty and effort. We're trying to reach to the top of the mount. And the way that and, and any mountain climber, he's going to be attached to that mountain, to the face of that rock, by a very strong cord. Because there will be times, you know, when our hands slip, when our foot slips, and we might fall even. But we won't plummet all the way to the bottom and end in, in you know, in a catastrophe. But if we have a strong cord, it will catch us it will keep us from falling, and it will allow us to recover and to continue to climb on. So that threefold cord is reading, exhortation, and doctrine. We see the need for it, and let's talk specifically about those braids. Number one, the first braid that we need to weave into that cord is the, 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 the cord of reading. As he says there, give attendance to reading. So reading is the basis for all study. This threefold cord really it begins with reading. I mean, without the reading, everything else is not going to happen. I mean, it is the foundation of Bible study is daily 
Bible reading. That's the first thing we need to look at. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17, and we'll look where we are instructed in Scripture to read daily in the Word of God. Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17. Then we're going to begin reading in verse 14. Deuteronomy 17, 14. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set thee, I will set a king over me, like as the nations that are about me, thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. But he shall but he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses. For as the Lord has said unto you, ye shall henceforth return nor no more that way. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver or gold. And it shall be, when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law, these statutes, to do them. So we see here, and if you would turn over to Deuteronomy 6, that God gave a very specific commandment to those that were the king, to those that would rule over the people of Israel, that the king was to write him a copy of the law, and that he was to read in it all the days of his life. And, you know, today we are likened to the kings and priests. We shall rule and reign with Christ. We also ought to be found daily reading. We ought to have a copy of these words, of these commandments with us. <coughs> Excuse me. And we ought to read all the days of our life. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 1. Now these are the commandments and statutes and judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might do them in the land where you go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's sons, all the days of thy life, that thy, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that, thou, that floweth with milk and, with, and honey." Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them, teach them diligently to thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and of thy gates. Do you get the impression here when we read this that God wants His people to pay attention to the commandments and the words of God? I mean, He's telling them here that they should talk of them when they sit us down, when they rise us up, when they walk by the way, when they sit in their house. That they should write them upon the frontlets of their eyes, that the commandments of God should always be before them. That they should write them upon the posts of their house. And you think about it, when a man goes in and out of his house to work, you know, there's one door in that house where he's going to go in and out of. And if there, the Word of God is written there, he's surely from day to day going to see the Word of God written before his eyes. So we see this principle here in Scripture. And it's very, and I don't think it's a very, you know, it's not a, it's not a stretch to think that God would want us to read the Bible daily. Jesus said, you know, give us this day our daily bread. Is not the Word of God the bread of life? Is not the Word of God something that we should be found in daily reading? So we see that the first strand of the threefold cord is the strand of Bible reading. Daily Bible reading. Now, that's, that's a very, you know, we ought to be, we're often exhorted to read the Bible. You know, we go to a church, a faithful word, where the whole sermons are dedicated to the topic of Bible reading. And I believe that's why we have a church that is full of people that read the Bible. And that's why we have a church that is full of people who understand and know the Word of God. Because there are people that read the Bible daily for themselves. And that's great. And we should be exhorted to do that. 
And I want to just take a minute here and maybe just give some practical ideas on how to read the Bible. What we should do. Now, you know, people will think, well, what do you mean how to read the Bible? Obviously, you know, you read it up and down, left to right. You know, you start at the back, you front, and work towards the back. I remember years ago, somebody asked me if I knew how to read the Bible. And I thought it was like this cryptic, mystic thing. And he said, you just you do it like this. You open it up, and then you start to, you know. And it was just a, he was trying to make a point that, you know, just reading the Bible is actually something that's very simple. But I believe that if we're going to be people who read the Bible daily, that if we're going to read the Bible every day, uh, you know, for the rest of our lives, if we're going to be in it for the long haul, and we're going to be found daily reading the Word of God all the days of our lives as we are commanded to do, that there are some practical tips that we could uh, incorporate into our Bible reading that will help us. Number one is have a plan to read. You know, have a Bible reading plan. Have Determine, you know, how many times do you want to read the Bible this year? Do you even know? Do you know how many times you're planning on reading the Bible in a year? And then you have to figure out, once you understand that number, once you understand, I'm going to read the Bible, you know, one time, or I'm going to read the Bible two times, or I'm going to read the Bible three times, or four times, or five times, or however many times you determine that you are going to read the Word of God that year, that you can begin to formulate a plan. One thing I like to do is, you know, I, I take how many pages of Bible I have, and I divide that by the number of days in a year, you know. So, like my New Testament, this Bible is a perfect example because there's 365 pages. So if I take 365 and divide it by the days of the year, I end up with one page per day. Meaning if I read one page per day of the New Testament, I would read the whole New Testament in one year. So once I understand how many, how many times I want to read the Bible in a year, how many pages I have, and how many pages, you know, you, you, know, you could just say, well, I want to just, to make it easy, just say I want to read the Bible one time this year. Take how many pages you have, well, the, divide it by 365, and then you know how many, time, how many pages you need to read uh, daily in order to read it once per year. And once you know that, then you can just multiply that number, how many pages per day, by however many times you want to read the Bible. So if I wanted to read the New Testament in one year, and I read one page a day, well, if I wanted to read it three times, I'd multiply that by three, so I'd read three pages per year, or whatever, whatever number you come up with. So that's a practical tip that will help us to be found in daily Bible reading, which is something that we need to do. Because as we read earlier, you know, evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse. And they're going to prey upon the ignorant. Those are the people that are going to get duped. I know when I've fallen for foolish doctrine, I've allowed myself to begin to be led astray. It's been during seasons of my life where I was not reading my Bible where I was not a consistent Bible reader. And if I were that, if I were, you know, if someone were to tell me something and I were able to say, you know what, I'm not sure about that, but as I read the Word of God, I'll keep it in mind. And we, we'd, we'd be able to read things as we go through the entire Bible, not just turning to select passages that someone would like to hand, you know, feed us and say, hey, here's my strange doctrine. Let me show you where it is in the Bible. And they show you where it is in the Bible, but you do not read the entire Bible for yourself because perhaps there's a verse somewhere else that would take the text that they're trying to deceive you with that would give a clear understanding and, and shed the true meaning of it. So we see that, you know, the need to read our Bibles. And that's the thing, you know, you start to preach about it and it's a dry subject to some people, you know, Bible reading. But it's the most fundamental and foundational thing that is going to help us stay attached to the, to the, 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 the Word of God is if we read the Word of God. We need to be found reading the Bible. And it's funny because, it's not really funny, but it just, you know, I'm one who has been saved a long time. And, you know, and, it, and it's unfortunate that it's this way, but, and you really don't, and it's easy to say, well, I was in a church that didn't really put a lot of emphasis on Bible reading. I mean, they, of course, would say that, yeah, you should read your Bible every day, you should read it so many times per year. But you were, when you're not in a church where the preacher is getting up and hounding you and getting after you about Bible reading. It's easy to slip. You know, I'm sure comments were made, but I don't think I've ever heard a whole sermon on Bible reading, just that topic, until I came to a church like Faithful Word. Right? So, and that's no excuse, but I'm just saying it's, 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 it's more encouraging, it's easier to follow through on that when you're in a church where that's being taught. And I've had to kind of play catch up because for the for the beginning of my Christian life, you know, I was not disciplined in daily Bible reading, and as a result, you know, I, I for a long time, 
I, I uh, endured some false doctrine. I allowed false doctrine to surround me. And, uh, you know, I'm, so I'm kind of trying to catch up, you know, get caught up in my Bible reading, trying to, you know, not necessarily, you know, uh, I'll read everybody, but just trying to, like, get a more familiarity with the Bible and the Word of God. And as I've done that, I've determined, you know, I have to read more. I have to read more than the average person. I believe a person who's read the Bible many, 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 many times and is very familiar with the Word of God, they probably don't have to do as much reading year to year. I mean, they've done so much reading in the Word of God that they don't have to be reading the Bible, you know, seven times a year, once a month, you know, all these, just this overboard amount of reading. But, and I've, I've expressed this to people and I've had them say things like, well, you know, you don't, don't read too much. And I don't think they understand what they're saying that when they say things like, well, you know, you can read too much Bible today, not in a day. You can't. Now, I've heard people say things, well, once you've read, read for about an hour, you know, you're probably getting a little burnt out. You probably should quit reading. And I think that's hogwash. I think that's nonsense. I think sitting down and reading the Bible for an hour, for two hours, for three hours, is something that's feasible. It's something that people can do. Maybe not every single day. You know, they just don't have, life has certain demands that we have to meet. But for an hour, for two hours, you know, there would be times where we could sit, you know, and maybe breaking it up through the day. We read an hour in the morning. We read two hours at night before bed. Whatever it is, we can get a lot more Bible reading in. There is no, the, the problem today is not that people are reading the Bible too much. That's not the problem that we're having. Now, I will say this. You can read the Bible too fast. I mean, you can get in such a rush, you can say, you know what? I'm going to read the Bible once a month. I'm going to read it 12 times this year, and you can get on steel and be on fire. That's great if you can do that. It's hard. Or you get, you know, I'm going to do a 40-day Bible, 40 Bible reading plan or whatever it is. <laughs> or you decide that you're just going to read a lot of Bible. Don't let that turn into you re speed reading the Bible. You should still keep a consistent and steady pace. So the problem is not that you can read the, the Bible too much. You want to read a line of Bible? That's great. I think we need a lot of that. We need more people to do that. But you have to make sure that you allot yourself more time and you don't turn it into this, this race through the Bible. But that it's rather that you, you, you still keep that pace, but you just give yourself more time to read more Bible. Now, another thing to help you in your daily Bible reading is something that really helped me is um, read the Bible in sections. Because if you're, going to read a, if you're going to read a larger quantity of Scripture, if you're going to endeavor to read the Bible a, multi, a multitude of times throughout the year, not just once or twice or three times, but maybe even more, um, you're going to need, what helped me a lot is, because here's the thing, a lot of people like to start in Genesis and just work their way through. And that's great, but you know, if you just start in Genesis and work your way through, it's a long time before you get to the New Testament. It's a long time before you get to the Gospels. It's a long time before you get to those... You know, because a lot of the doctrine that we believe and teach is found in the New Testament, which is a, a much short, much shorter than the Old Testament. So my advice is to read the Bible in sections. And it's interesting that the Bible can can be divided up uh, in certain ways. Like first of all, you have the five books of Moses. You know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So you got the five books, right? So that's one section. Then you have your historical books. You know, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. Uh, first and Second Chronicles, you got um, Esther, right? You got these 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 historical books. That's another section. Then you have another section in the Old Testament of poetry and wisdom, where you've got you know Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Songs, uh, Ecclesiastes. So that would be another section, right? So that's three sections. Then you have your major prophets, right? And then you have your minor prophets. So you have five sections that you could break your Bible reading up. You say, hey, I'm going to read the Old Testament X amount of times. You know, and you could go to each section and determine how many pages are in each of those sections and how many pages from each of those sections do I need to read it, read it X number of times a year. Instead of just trying to plow through the whole thing, because then you're getting a little bit of everything, which I really like plans like that. And yeah, this is a matter of preference. I'm, of course, not saying that this is the way you must read your Bible. But it's been helpful to me. And I believe that other people would benefit from it as well. And then you would turn to the New Testament. You could read Gospel and Acts as one test, as section. And then you could read you know, epist all the epistles and Revelation as a second section. So as you read the Bible throughout the year, you're reading you know, all these different sections. It's not just trying to push through the whole Bible, but rather you're reading all these other sections throughout the year. And uh, you're, you're getting a, a well-balanced meal. 
Another thing that's helped me in my daily Bible reading as I've endeavored to, you know, uh, uh, braid this threefold cord of Bible study that we wouldn't be, you know, shaken about and, and tossed every wind of doctrine is to read the genealogies out loud. You know, when you get the first nine chapters of, you know, of First Chronicles, where it's just this long litany of names that are hard to pronounce. Now, some of the best advice I've ever heard and, and, and put into practice is reading those out loud. You know, one, it keeps your attention. It keeps you, because it's easy when you just read, the, you know, the son of, the son of, the son of, the son of. You get just into this monotone, just repetitive, kind of just, just saying it without really thinking. But um, to say those out loud, because one, it keeps your attention, and two, it makes you a better reader, right? It teaches you how to read the words as they're written on the page, and it makes you a better orator. It makes you be able to get up and pronounce things more clearly and, and to, to make the words more distinct. You know, and that's important, especially if we're one who endeavors to stand up and preach the Word of God. Because I've had the, the, the opportunity, the blessing, the, the, I've been very fortunate here at Faithful Word that you know, I've, been, I've, been, I've been asked to preach. Uh, several times at Faithful Word. I've, of course, I've got get to preach weekly up here at the North location, and it's it's a great opportunity. It's a great blessing. I'm very grateful for it. And I've been able uh, for for a long time. I was uh, a regular song leader, so I was able to get up in the pulpit and get used to being behind the pulpit in front of God's people. And uh, you know, that's also you know it's something that's very people think of preaching and, and leading the songs often is something that make, would make one very nervous. And it does, you know, I'll be, you know, I preached recently at Faithful Word, and I have to admit that when I got up there, I was nervous. You know, it's, it's different than the Faithful Word North location, because when you go to preach on the main campus, you have literally hundreds of eyeballs staring at you, and, you know, and it's, it's the caliber of people that you're preaching to, and uh, not to mention, you know, that you're being broadcast to, you know, tens of thousands of people throughout, you know, the entire world. So that can be a little nerve-wracking. But um, the most nerve-wracking thing I've ever done was not leading the songs, and it was not preaching. The most nerve-wracking thing I've ever done and behind the pulpit, faithful word, is get up and read the scripture. I've only done it once. I think several of the men that normally read were out, and um, I kind of noticed in the morning service that, you know, we had to scramble to find someone. You know, pastor was kind of looking as he was, and then, and you know, who's going to read while he was up there announcing the scripture to read. So I made note of that in the, in the morning service, or the evening service, and I was ready. I was looking at him, because I knew he was going to look around again. And he looked at me, we made eye contact, and he kind of gave me the, like, you know, do you want to do it, kind of nod, and I said, yeah. So I got up there to read, and it wasn't a very difficult passage of Scripture, but what I realized very quickly is that, is that everybody else has turned to that same text. And as you're saying these words out loud, they're reading right along with you. And if you make a mistake, it's going to be so obvious. It's, you, it's not like in preaching, you know, if you, if you fumble over your words when you're preaching or something like that, you guys don't have my notes. You can't tell how confused and how lost I am up here. You have no idea. But when you're reading the scripture, you know, the entire congregation, if they're, if they're doing what they should and reading along with you, they understand, you know, when you mispronounce a word. And I've gotten up at other times, you know, during a preaching class, and this is not a story that I can share publicly, but I've said things, you know, not, not you know, that were blasphemous or, or anything like that, but things that were just misspoken that came across as very crude. And that was something that made me feel about this big. And it was one of those experiences where you sat down and you just wanted to kind of slither out under the door and, uh, and disappear forever. So that was, that, that's the point I'm trying to make here is that when we should read difficult portions, of, portions of, of, of Scripture out loud because it will make us better orders. It will make us able to speak more clearly and to not fumble over our words. Another great thing is to, to, to read your family from a yearly Bible. This is something that, <coughs> you know, we've tried several times in my family. We're trying to be more serious about it. Now, my wife reads with the kids on a daily basis. You know, they... I'll even hear her from time to time if I'm home at that time where she's reading to the kids, and it's great. I'm glad she does that. She's, you know, pausing to teach them things from the Word of God. I believe the mother, you know, a mother is a preacher to her children, a teacher, an instructor. I think that's a very important role, and it's something that all mothers should be doing. But I think that as a, as a father, as a husband, as a man, we ought to be reading the Word of God to our family as well. And that's something I'm, I'm really just trying to nail down even in my own life. Because, you know, I've heard my wife 
read certain passages of scripture to my to my children, and she can't help it, but there's just like certain passages that just doesn't sound the same, you know, when, when a woman's reading it, you know, nicely, and, you know, reading it like she would be reading like a Dr. Seuss book or something like that, you know, where it just it doesn't and she can't do anything about it, you know. I just believe that when a man reads the scripture, that it gives that certain masculine tone because God is masculine. You know, God is, 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 a, is, is, is a man, right? He, he is of the male gender. If you were going to assign a gender to God, it would be a man, right? God is not female. He is male. So it makes sense that his word, you know, when it's read by a man, that it gives it that authoritative tone that it needs. That it gives it, because there's passages in Scripture that are very harsh. Passages in Scripture that are very strong, that need to be spoken with great authority. So I believe that a man should read to his, Bible, his family from a yearly Bible. And one last tip in Bible reading before I move on uh, would be this, that we need to read, I would emphasize the New Testament over the Old Testament in terms of reading. You know, I would say that, you know, if let's say if you're going to read the Bible four times a year, well, you're, that means you're going to read a lot of Old Testament in, compar in, in comparison to the New Testament. You know, you're not reading anywhere near as much of the New Testament as you're reading the Old. I believe that a person should try to read the Old Testament more than the, the New Testament. They should try to read the New Testament more than the Old Testament. Not saying that they should slack off on the Old Testament, but rather that they you know, should both hold them to a standard and then just increase the reading of the New Testament. You know, we could read the New Testament once a month. We could read it you know, twice a, once every two months. Something like that, where, where we read and we read the Old Testament a little less than that. If you, know, if you read the, Bible, the Old New Testament, Old Testament three or four times, maybe you should try reading the Old Testament six or, or the New Testament six or seven times. Hopefully that came out right. But we should be trying to, I believe that, I believe we should put more of an emphasis on the reading of the New Testament and that we should be found daily in the New Testament. And that's why, again, going back to that, that point earlier, that that's why it's great to divide the Word of God, at the very least, old for new, and read separately. Daily, excuse me. Now, moving on, so we see that the first chord in, in the threefold chord of Bible study is Bible reading. And, you know, we're, we're going a little long, so I'll try to move quickly here, but um, point number two, or that second braid in that threefold chord of Bible reading, would be exhortation. He says, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. So the second chord there is exhortation. Now, exhortation, I believe, would be what we learn from preaching. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I charge thee, there, thee therefore before God and Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. So he tells them here, Paul tells Timothy that he is to preach the word, and he tells them how to preach the word. He's to be instant, in season, out of season. In his preaching, he is to reprove. In his preaching, he is to, re he is to rebuke. And in his preaching, he is to exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So we see that exhortation is a form or an aspect of preaching. So when Paul is prescribing this threefold chord of Bible study, the reading and the exhortation, I believe that it would we would be uh, accurate in saying that exhortation, well, that would be preaching. Now, maybe in Timothy's case, he's going to give attendance to his own preaching or how he preaches. But I believe as those of us that would receive preaching, that it is a great source that will help us in our Bible study, is how we, uh, how we entreat the preaching of the Word of God, the exhortation of the Word of God. You see, I believe that preaching is a significant source of knowledge. And I've heard other people say that, you know, preaching is like, they try to liken preaching unto this, uh, just like this, this extra. Like it's just something that we get that's just, you know, we're very, it's not a, a necessary thing. But I, I, I disagree with that. I believe that, you know, we could liken it unto this, that daily Bible reading, daily Bible reading would be like your bread. That would be like the bread that you'd need to eat every day. That would just be like your basic sustenance. That's what you'd need to just, you know, fuel yourself through the day. You know, you wake up and you eat your eggs and you eat your toast. That's the daily Bible reading. That's what's going to give you energy and help you and work throughout the day. But, and I believe that preaching would be like that steak dinner. Like that's that strong meat. That's when you go out and you get that, that nice, big, juicy steak. That man, something that really sits with you. That's something that you have to chew on a little longer, right? It's something you have to really cut into and dig into and have to, you know, you don't just give it to little kids. It's something that preaching, when it's received right, is something that 
you know, that we can last us a while. It's something that we can savor. It's something that we can take with us. Like a perfect good illustration of this would be like, you know, my lunch consists is very meager, and it consists of, uh, but it's very delicious, and I look forward to it because you skip breakfast. You know, when you go without every to the hungry soul, every better thing is sweet, right? So when you skip breakfast, no matter how meager that 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 lunch is. Man, it's good. You look forward to it. I look forward to my daily tortilla chips and my lunch. You know, I have my door, my tortilla chips, my three slices of cheese, and some beef jerky in a uh, in a very large jug of water. And I look forward to it. And it would and, and the daily Bible reading. Well, that would be like the tortilla chips. That like every day I know that I'm going to get some carbs. I'm going to get some salt. I'm going to get you know something that's going to help me get through the afternoon and continue to do my job. That's like the daily Bible reading. But I believe like preaching would be like, for example, uh, yesterday afternoon we were invited over to a friend's house and he served us, I mean, ch this fried chicken with these spices and, and uh, pulled pork with this homemade house sauce and, and pork loin and sausages. I mean, just a, a smattering of, of several different meats of, of pork and, it was, and beef. It was just delicious. I mean, but you know what? He doesn't eat like that every day. You know, that was a special occasion, but that was something that well, I got to look forward to. And it was something that was a little bit more uh, savory than just my tortilla chips. You know, the preaching of the Word of God, I and mean, when we read the Word of God, it's something that we a lot of times we do out of duty. It's something we do out of discipline. But when we go and hear the preaching of the Word of God, that's when we might get a little bit more excited about the Word of God. When we know what are we going to learn from the Word of God? What great truth is going to be expounded to us? What encouragement, what exhortation are we going to receive from the preaching of the Word of God? And I believe it's something that we can learn a great deal from, and it's something that you know will help us in our Christian life, is if we receive the preaching of the Word of God. It's something that gives us another strong strand in the threefold cord of Bible study. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 2, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby. So we should receive the milk of the Word through our reading and through our you know, our, our, um, the preaching of the Word of God. We will receive milk, but we have to understand that, you know, once we are, we should be weaned from that milk. And that was Paul's desire. Paul, a preacher of the Word of God, desired to serve his people meat. It says in 1 Corinthians 3, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are, are ye able. So we see that, you know, there was a time where he had to feed them milk. But eventually, you know, we should grow in the, in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ through our reading and through the preaching of the Word of God. That we should receive the milk of the Word of God through preaching, but also that preaching is something that we should receive meat from, from strong meat. You see, God has ordained that we should learn from the teaching of others. It's, there's nothing wrong with getting your doctrine from the, from the preaching of the Word of God. In fact, I believe it is a very significant source and something that accelerates your growth. I mean, of course, we could argue and say that, hey, there's nothing, you know, we have no need that any man should teach, it, teach it us, right? That we have the Spirit of God and that we have the ability to learn and know all things from the Word of God. That we could read the Word of God when we are indwelt with the Spirit of God and we could allow God to show us and we can understand the things of God, the mind of Christ that is in the Bible. We could come to the same conclusions that all these preachers have come to that would have taught us these things that we, we know and understand. But how long would that take? How long would it take you to understand all the doctrines that you understand today if it were not for the, word, for the preaching of the Word of God? You see, the preaching of the Word of God is, is not just this multivitamin. It's not just this gravy. It's just not this side dish that people sometimes try to make it out to be. We should not make light of the importance of preaching in our life. If, if, if preaching were just something that were not maybe not optional, but just something that you know was a little bit more lighthearted, and that we, we ought to rely more on our own just reading of the Word of God to, to, to glean our doctrine, if it were something that were just you know not as important as it is, then why, why else would we gather to hear it? Why is it so important that we come together to hear the preaching of the Word of God? Bible says in Hebrews 10, let us consider one another to provoke and unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So as we see the day approaching, as we see evil men are going to wax worse and worse and seducing and deceiving and being deceived, we ought to exhort one another. 
And we ought to, and we ought to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together to receive that exhortation. We need to receive the Word of God through preaching, and that is something that is going to be very significant in our in, in weaving the threefold cold of Bible study. There's nothing wrong with taking a, a, a sermon and and writing the notes and and, and understanding the points and and, glean, and establishing our doctrine through what we've been taught through the preaching of the Word of God. Now I'll say this: you know, if, if the preaching of the Word of God is that strong meat that is being fed us, it's the strong doctrine of the, you know, the, the post-trib rapture. It's the strong doctrine of salvation by grace through faith. It's that strong doctrine of eternal security. It's the strong doctrine that, you know, rebukes these false lies of Calvinism and, and work salvation and all these other things. We ought to receive those things and we ought to chew those things and we ought to let them sink down inside of us and become a part of, our, our, of who we are spiritually and work into the fiber of our spiritual being. But... When we receive those things and we chew that meat, we must be careful of the bones. You know, that's I think where people make the mistake when they when they use allow preaching to become a significant source of doctrine, which I believe they should, but they begin to just swallow everything that they're fed in. Because we must understand that though you are being fed by a man of God who has done his own study and yet even himself for a, a, a great deal of time received the preaching of the Word of God and and is now one who is learned and aged and able to, to, to preach and to feed the flock of God, even though you're receiving it from that type of a man, you must understand you are still receiving it from a man, a fallible man who is able to make mistakes, a fallible man who is able to misunderstand things or repeat things without fully understanding what it is that he's saying. The Bible says in Acts 17, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews, these were more noble than they in Thessalonica in that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether these things were so. So it wasn't that they went to a church like this you know, and thought about what they were going to be doing after service or staring at their watch or scrolling through Facebook or something like that or just daydreaming. No, they went there, Bible in hand, the scriptures in hand, with a ready mind, ready to receive the Word of God, ready to pay attention to what was being taught, ready to take note of the strong meat of the doctrine of the Word of God and make it a part of, of who they were spiritually and establish the things that they believed by it. But it also says that they search the Scriptures daily. You see, that's how one hand washes the other here. When our daily Bible reading and our, and our receiving of the Word of God come together, then we can be sure that what we're receiving is not, we're not going to choke on the bones of, of, the, of, of man's mistakes. We're not going to, to, to be deceived by, by a man. Even if he isn't intentionally trying to do it, that a man of God might get up behind the, word, behind the pulpit and because he is, you know, he's not infallible, we'll make mistakes, we'll say things we'll, that will be misunderstood or that are incorrect. If we are daily Bible readers, if we are... Bereans, if we search the scriptures daily as we ought, with all readiness of mind, then, then the preaching of the word of God becomes a very strong and great source of, 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 uh, of, of study. Of being able to take something and say, you know what, I've heard this sermon, I've heard this topic preached, I've heard this subject expounded, I'm going to go home and I'm going to study it. I'm going to see it out, whether this is so. And as I, I'm going to keep it in mind as I search the scriptures daily. And I've done that. There are several things that, that I have heard preached that, well, not even several things. I would say very few things that, that I've kept in mind throughout the years and said, I don't know about that. I'm not sure whether or not I agree with that. And rather than going home and just trying to do a word search or something like that, you know, what I do is as I read my Bible, you know, if I can keep it in my mind, then I'll look for that. Or if I'll hear other sermons on a similar subject, on the same subject, I'll listen to what another man of God has to say about it. In turn, of course, turn to those passages and read those. But as I read the Bible, paying attention when those subjects are brought up. So we see here that, you know, we have, we've talked about the first two uh, chords of Bible study. That they are, you know, the daily Bible reading and that they are, of course, um, you know, receiving the exhortation of the Word of God. Those are two strands. And when we weave those two strands together, 
Then we can weave in that third one, and this is where the cord, the three-fold cord, becomes very strong. And that way it's really going to uh, uh, secure us to the, to, the, to the principles of Christ and not allow us to be tossed to and fro. And I believe that, because it says there, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. So he makes a very clear distinction. Reading, exhortation, and doctrine. We talk about the reading and the exhortation. Now what is the doctrine? Well, I, I think the doctrine, this is where you really have to get your hands dirty. This is where, this is the nitty gritty. This is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. Because when you get into doctrine, this is when you're going to be talking about very specific truths and teachings and principles that are found in the Word of God and that are taught from the Word of God. And in order to have this cord of doctrine in your threefold cord of Bible study, you must have a familiarity with Scripture. You must know the Bible, at least to some degree. And, that, and the greater degree you know the Bible and are more familiar with the Bible, the stronger your doctrine is. I mean, the strongest... The most sound men that I know, the men of God, that have the strongest doctrine, that are able to expound what they believe, even, even just, not in a sermon, just off the top of their head, off the, just, it's on the tip of their tongue, they're able to expound what they believe, they know why they believe what they believe, are men that have spent a great deal of time reading the Bible. So again, as I said in the beginning of the sermon, reading, daily Bible reading, you know, might have been a, when I got on that point, might have been a little bit of a lull in the sermon because it's not, you know, it's just it's just this dry subject to people. But you see how important it is. You see how essential it is. If you're going to become one who is able to exhort and be able to exhort with strong doctrine, it's all founded upon Bible reading. You must be familiar with the scriptures if you're going to have the strong cord of doctrine in your life. Now, reading, and you know, that's something, as we read through it, I, I, you know, one thing that would be very helpful, one thing that I've, I've begun to do is to take notes as you engage in reading or as you engage in receiving the exhortation, the preaching of the Word of God. When you hear something or someone talk, talks about a certain subject, to make a note in your Bible, follow, maybe write notes on, on a, a piece of paper and going over it. Those are things that are going to help you, things that you can go back and, and look over and say, man, I need to memorize these scriptures. Or, man, I need to, to make sure I know what is being taught here in the Word of God. And that's what's going to give you your doctrine. The Bible says in Isaiah 28, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. So this point about doctrine, about weaving in this braid of doctrine into our threefold cord of Bible study, is that we need to understand that there are many truths that are going to be learned over time. That it's now we're gonna we're not gonna just sit down one day and just read and just understand the, the depths and the knowledge of Christ in just a short period of time. That it will take years, it will take a lifetime that of, of understanding the many truths, the many doctrines that are taught in the Word of God. And that's why it says here, precept upon precept, one is built upon another. There are certain things you must understand. I mean, think about it in the Christian life. The first thing you have to understand, before you can understand the, you know, who is Babylon of end times, these, you know, these deep studies, before you can understand the post-trip rapture, although that's really not that hard to understand, I don't think. But before you can, you know, thoroughly expound it and 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 uh articulate it to somebody else. The first thing you have to understand is salvation by grace through faith. I mean, you have to be saved. Before you'll ever understand anything out of the Word of God, the first precept, the first line, the foundation that is laid is that of salvation. I mean, that's true for everybody. And that's just a principle that's being taught here in Isaiah 28 that it's line upon line, you know, precept to precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. As we're reading through, as we're receiving the Word of God, and we're taking notes, we're marking things down, we're paying attention, we're receiving, we're studying, we're, we're searching the scriptures, our doctrine can begin to form. And that's when we can begin to have a strong cord of Bible study. So there are many truths to be learned over time. And that's why I'm going to do a little alliteration here. That in order to have doctrine, dedication to discipline is demanded. Maybe that's a little too much. But in order to have strong doctrine, 
you have to be dedicated to discipline. To have strong doctrine, you must be dedicated to discipline. Because to have strong doctrine, you have to memorize Scripture. I mean, you have to memorize Scriptures. Passages, verses, to be able to explain why you believe what you believe. Because your whole everything you believe is founded upon this book. But do you know where to go in the book? Do you know why you believe what you believe? It's, you should memorize Scriptures. You need to be able to compare Scriptures with other Scriptures. When, a, when an evil man who is waxing worse and worse comes to seduce you, to deceive you with the Word of God, are you able to take what he's bringing and compare it with other Scriptures to see whether these things be so? You need to have a familiarity with the Word of God. You need to have a, 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 a working knowledge of the Word of God. <clears throat> and I believe that's why sound doctrine is, so, is sorely lacking today for these reasons. Because we see that reading is a discipline. Because we see that going to church and paying attention to the preaching of the Word of God is a discipline. Because we see that understanding doctrine, that laying line upon line, precept upon precept, here little, there little, is something that takes a, a discipline. It takes a dedication. It takes time and effort and energy. And we're living in a, in a, in a society and a culture today where everybody wants everything quick, easy, and fast, and with no trouble. They want everything to just come to them and to just be served to them, brought to them, and just not have to put forth any effort or very little effort. But that's not how it works in the Word of God. And that's why today we have such a why I believe, and it will continue to be this way, and why it will wax worse and worse, is because people are ignorant of the Word of God, because they're lazy and they do not want to put the effort of reading, of exhortation, of doctrine. They don't want to take the time to sit down and braid those cords together to have that threefold cord that is not easily broken. And that's why they are easily pushed off the rock of the Word of God and find themselves tossed to and fro with every wave of false doctrine. The Bible says in 2 Timothy, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So it says it's study. You're going to be approved of God, you need to study. And he says that requires you to be a workman. Study is work. It is, it is a task. It is a chore. It is something that you labor in. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, And further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books, there is no end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. If you are one who's going to say, I'm going to read the Bible, Bible a multitude of times and determine that you know, you're going to have to read several hours a day in order to accomplish that goal, you're going to find very quickly that it is weariness, that your eyes will literally become tired, that your flesh will find times where it would rather not do it, that you will have to train your mind, that you have to work on lengthening your attention span to understand what it is you're reading and you're not just glossing over words on a page. It is effort, and it will weary you. And the re that's one of the reasons today why sound doctrine is so sorely lacking, because it is difficult, because it is, takes effort. And as a result, what a lot of people do today is that they just lean upon corrupt sources. Rather than going to the Word of God themselves, rather than receiving sound doctrine through the preaching of the Word of God, whether, rather than searching the Scriptures, whether these things are so, what they begin to do is they just learn it from a corrupt source. They just allow somebody else to spoon feed them. You know, and examples of these would be like commentaries or encyclopedias where people just go, well, I want to know about a certain subject that the Bible talks about. And rather than going to the Word of God and putting in time and effort and energy in the reading of the Word of God, they'd rather just pull a book off the shelf. You know, they'd rather just go pull Way of Strife literature off the shelf and begin to read it and allow David Proud to tell them how they, what they need to believe about a certain subject instead of going to it and understanding for themselves what the Word of God teaches. They'd rather just go to the commentary, you know, of Matthew Henry, the Presbyterian baby sprinkler, you know, who mocked Baptists in several of his writings, and, and allow him to whisper in their ear sweet little nothings and flowery speeches. They'd rather go to Charles Spurgeon, the Calvinist, and pull his encyclopedia of David off there to understand what the Bible says about the book of Psalms and other, other books. They lean upon corrupt sources because they do not want to put in the effort and the energy and the time that it takes to become sound in doctrine for themselves. You know, Bible colleges is another example of this. If I just go to Bible college and put in my time and get my four-year degree, I'll walk out just a bulwark of sound doctrine, unmovable, steadfast, just 
a, a, a the pinnacle of, of, of all you know that is right and holy in sound doctrine. No. It's one of the worst sources of false doctrine is found in Bible colleges today. Study Bibles. You know, you get your 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 uh, your CI Schofield study Bible out and allow him to start teaching you about the several dispensations. You get your your Ruckmanite study Bible out and you read, you know, a, a quarter page of text and then a, another three quarter pages of man's notes to expound to you, you know, why there are several church ages. I mean, it's it's in the very first page of Genesis and say I Schofield's uh, study Bible that he's trying to teach you the gap theory. And I've gone to people, I've gone to people who've had those Bibles and said, did you know that teaches the gap theory? <laughs> it's on the first page. And they don't like it. But that's because they'd rather just have somebody else tell them what to believe rather than figuring out what they believe for themselves. They'd rather just have someone go to Home Depot and buy the cheap yellow cord in bulk and cut off a nice long length and hand it to them. And then they're surprised when it begins to fray and when they go to tow something out of a ditch that it snaps. Instead of sitting down and weaving a strong cord for themselves. Instead of going to, you know, the, to, the, to the mom and pop shop and buying a high security chain. You know, that's something that's going to take many foot pounds of pressure to break. And they don't want to put in the effort of having to go a little further, spend a little more money to get that strong, you know, towing cable. They want that cheap, easy fix. I mean, you see these guys on YouTube that try to tow, pull people out of ditches with some of these... They'll like tie, it's like you're going to tie t-shirts together trying to pull somebody out of a mud pit. It's crazy. And if anybody who's living in a northern climate knows that if you go off the ditch in the winter, you know, there's something called a towing strap. And it's a very, you know, it's a very wide strap with very high tensile strength. And that's what we need. If we're going to stay secured, if we're going to be able to pull others out of the ditch, we need that strong three-fold cord of Bible study. We don't need these cheap imitations, these cheap this twine of the commentaries, this string of Bible colleges, these just are poor substitutes for what we need. It will require sacrifice. It will require sacrifice. If you're going to weave the three, four cold of Bible study, you need to understand that it's going to require sacrifice of your time. That's more than anything. And time, honestly, is the most valuable thing anybody has on this earth. It is, the, it is one of those few things that you cannot replace. It is invaluable time. And then you have to determine what's more important to you. Your hobby, your pastime, your, your, your leisurely pleasure, or becoming one who is sound in doctrine and faith. I'm all for hobbies and pastimes. I don't think we should just be people that, you know, don't have any fun ever. That kind of a thing. But, you know, life's not all about fun. Life is about work. Life is about accomplishing something. And if we're going to do a great work for God, if we're going to do something big for God, if we're going to do something significant and be found workmen that need not to be ashamed before God, we're going to have to study. We're going to have to work. We're going to have to put in time and effort. So it might be cost us, you know, maybe, maybe we can't take that jiu-jitsu class. Because instead of getting up at 6 in the morning and go roll around on some mat, we need to be found in the Word of God. You know, maybe we won't be able to be that, you know, expert bow hunter. Because instead of going out and checking field cameras, you know, every week and putting out food plots and figuring out windages and where to put up a, a good stand and, and practicing our, the skills needed to, to, you know, bring down that trophy buck, it might be that we have to, you know, rather study the Word of God, memorize the Word of God. Instead of, you know, when we're driving down the road, turning on the AM radio, and letting Rush Limbotomy, you know, lobotomize our, our brains, uh, or Sean Insanity, you know, drive us up a wall with, with Republican uh, talking points. It might be that we have to, you know, get out the three by five card and say, I'm going to memorize Matthew 5, you know, 6 and 7, 10, and other portions. You know, Matthew 24, Luke 13. We should have memorized these things, Mark 13, excuse me. But we, you know, that might be that. It might, that's the sacrifice that we're going to have to make. Rather than listening to the, you know, the MMA podcast that we love, maybe we should listen to some Bible reading or, 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 or Bible, some Bible preaching. But we have to understand that you know, it will yield godly results. In the end, you'll come out with a, with a, with a strongly forged chain, forged chain. You will come out with a three-fold cord that is not easily broken. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 4, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed to thyself and under the doctrine. Continue in them. 
For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a major motivation. You know, to save yourself from the false doctrine, to save yourself from the, 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 you know, the, the, the cunning craftiness of men who lie in wait to deceive us, that we're going to have to sacrifice. We're going to have to give ourselves wholly to them. And not only that, we'll be able to save ourselves, but we'll also be able to save others. You know, the preacher is going to be able to get up and expound the Word of God and to demolish false doctrine when he hears it. To take a, a, a heresy that has crept into his church and to dismantle it point by point. He is one who's going to have to be found having read and studied and memorized the Word of God. You see, the strong fold, the, 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 the threefold cord, the strong cord of study will save us from falsehood. But it requires reading, exhortation, and doctrine. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for, uh, Lord, all that we can glean from it. Thank you that we have a strong foundation. Lord, that we do not have to be tossed to and fro. And we, that we can be founded upon a rock. And Lord, that we can be fruitful in it. Even in a world that is corrupt and falling apart and just breaking at its seams, Lord, that we can be uh, we can be firm, we can be unmovable, we can be fruitful. And Father, that we can abound unto, unto great things for you. Lord, if we would grow in knowledge and in grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, help us to do that. Help us to be found as the Bereans, Lord, that we would search the Scriptures daily, that we would receive the preaching of God with all readiness of mind, and that as a result, Lord, that we would have strong and firm doctrine that cannot be shaken. Lord, we thank you for uh, your love towards us. We thank you uh, for all the great things you've done for us. Keep us safe as we go. Bring us back again next week. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay.